patent patents on a condominium. How do you, can you do that since it's a shared space? If you can divide your meets and bounds down the middle of that wall, yeah. Okay, so it's really about this, the walls of where your space is, okay. okay Condos cool. are tough. <laughs> Okay. I, I actually own a condo in downtown Bend that I bought for my mother-in-law a long time ago. The problem is they're stacked this way. Right. So I can't claim the land patent under it because then I affect the people above me and the people above that. Mm -hmm. So some condos are stacked this way and if you've got a perfect meets and bounds that divides the wall, you could probably claim it. Okay. The problem with condos is a lot of times there's a, you got all kinds of people controlling things. Yeah. Homeowners associations, yeah. condo associations. Okay. They're a pain in the ass. Okay. Sell it, buy a house. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was reviewing the steps to take dominion over all jurisdictions and on, um, Number nine, your business on land should be a PMA, private member association, or as a trading company, I recommend a PMA. Um, so I have an LLC. Is that hard to That's change on water. to L, um, PMA? Can you explain can, that? Can it be converted? Bit? I don't know how to do yeah, that. You I'm can a baby business owner. You, so you can dissolve an LLC or a corporation and, and rewrite the whole thing as a PMA. Move all the assets into it. Do it through a trust, do it through a private membership association, make all your members a part of it. The reason it, there, it gives you two options there is depending on the nature of the business, some businesses are pretty hard to uh, claim as a PMA. You remember Route 66, the old Route 66, the one from California to Chicago? If you drive Route 66, you'll see all these old businesses with the signs still up there that says, so-and-so trading company, so-and-so trading company, so-and-so trading company. When the whole Federal Reserve stuff started in about 1912, and it took them a while to really put everything into place to make this happen, but People were sold during that period of time on getting rid of their trading companies and limiting their liability by doing an LLC or a corporation, pretty much. Registering it with the state. They were sold a bill of goods. A bunch of hoo-ha, really. And they would have been better off keeping their trading companies. Okay? But that's why we had trading companies because we were free as free men everybody was a state national back then we were free to trade with anyone we wanted any other state national we could barter we could trade most of our money back then was gold and silver it was real money and therefore trading companies okay gold and silver being Real money. What is real money? Real money is the same as anything else. It's the same as a commodity. It's the same as a feather. If you need feathers, and I have feathers, I can trade her for eggs or something that I need, right? Gold and silver is the same way. It's just an interim exchange. If you remember in the Bible, King Solomon, King David, okay? King Solomon was the son of King David. His people loved him. King Solomon's lands controlled the world. Worldwide. King Solomon was blessed with the ability to walk across the soil of our land and he could feel the minerals in the earth beneath him. And he'd say, dig here, there's gold. Dig here, there's silver. Dig here, there's diamonds, rubies, whatever. He was blessed with that ability. King Solomon's mines weren't in one location in Africa as the old 1930s movie said it was. Okay, They were all over the world. The Philippines had a tremendous amount of gold. There were 17 caves were filled with it in the Philippines. Okay, New Zealand 
tons of gold in New Zealand. 1769, they put that gold on deposit with the king of England. The king of New Zealand, the Maoris, put the gold on deposit with the king to hold in trust for the people of New Zealand. And then they did timber contracts and sold them timber and all, every, it became a mess because once the World Bank got their whole hand on it, they didn't want to give it back. Once the queen got her hold on it, she didn't want to give it back. See? So the Maoris have been King George Joaquin Tutari right now, who exists right now, is 50 years old. He grew up in a shanty town. He's a king. He is worth hundreds of millions of dollars in gold. And his family's crest is stamped on the back of these gold bars sitting in Europe. And they won't give it to him. What's his name? King George Joaquin Tutari. Okay. So you got the Maoris, the Maoris, the Hawaiians. Do you know all the islands of the Pacific? All the kings? The king of Hawaii before the United States took Hawaii and stole it from them? All those kings of those islands? were 12 sons under the king of Maori in 1769. And the king, when he died, he gave Polynesia and Easter Islands and the Cook Islands and Hawaiian Islands, and he gave them to each one of his sons to be a king of. And then we came in later and took, it, took the lands from the king. But they were 12 sons, all Maori. A little history. <clears throat> Could you please spell Dun and Brad number? I'm not sure how to even spell that. Dun and Brad Street? Is that what it is? Dun You're looking yeah. for the website? It's just spell the. D U N N. D N N N. It's a credit bureau okay. like TransUnion and Experian are for us. Dun and Brad Street is a credit bureau for all corporations. And so Dun is D-U-N-N, and then what's Brad Street? Just B-R-A-D-E-R Street. Okay. And then um, what's the least amount of pages you've ever seen on an affidavit of repudiation? Because I'm looking at your 32 page, and I'm overwhelmed. I'm like, three, I, four. Three or four? It doesn't have to be 32 pages. Okay. Shoot, I've done affidavits that were 99 pages. I kept it under 100. Okay. Okay. And then how much time will steps 1 through 11 that we have went over today, like that affidavit and like the... Uh, passport, how, how much time would that take an average woman, would you say, that's really committed to doing all this? What the hell's an average woman? <laughs> I have never met one of those animals. Well, I mean, maybe not so average then. <laughs> <laughs> you might get it done in two weeks, and it might take her four months. Who knows? I mean, there's no such thing as an average woman, by the way. Well, I'm hoping okay? that I can get all this done within a year or that's less. That's a tough species just for me to figure out. <laughs> I know so. we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have a better answer for her than I do. Um, last question. <laughs> last kind of, I have two more questions. Can I get an email of all your PowerPoints just so I can study them? I want to be all a teacher. All you got to do is email me and ask. <laughs> okay. And what steps would, for safety would you suggest people who talk about this stuff online vocally have? Would you, is there any for safety? For safety? Yeah, I guess. I mean, Just do it. <laughs> just I'm do like it. Nike. Just do it. <laughs> all right. You know, it really depends on you and your employer. Then don't worry about it. You got yourself permission. Um, Some employers don't like you talking about things online, on your social media. That's where the real danger lies in losing your job. If you learn this stuff, you could probably tell them where to go, how to get there. So my <laughs> husband's quickly. taking uh, uh, out his 401k. And they said he's doing it now because they said he has three years to pay the taxes with because of the COVID. But is there a way if he hasn't, I mean, to not pay those taxes back with what you're saying? You're talking about back taxes right now? The 401k, like he's going to take oh. out that money. You can take money out and not pay taxes for three years. Well, okay, first of all, you deposited a 401k with some corporation. That corporation is going to decide whether 
their requirements are that ye, they have to withhold from you. Okay? Are they going to follow the IRS law? Chances are they probably will. They'll probably not let you take it all out at once. Now some let you transfer it. Some let you transfer it into a gold or silver 401k. That's what I would recommend doing. Um, so his situation <laughs> right now she is... She's going to jump in and answer this. Well, <laughs> he's actually, they said he has three years with the COVID thing, but he's quitting his job. So he's taking out his 401k, the whole thing right now. So I mean, I'm just wondering, is he going to have to take... Right, he, yeah. gets, he, gets, he can get a penalty if, if he's still claiming to be a U.S. citizen, he's still filing his 1040s, if he's still doing all this. I'd recommend sending in a Form 56, declaring your status like I told you to do earlier, and then taking it out and telling them where to go with it. So, so do your status first and then Absolutely. you have rights. But if you don't do your status the first, The reason you I talk rights. about status over and over and over again is, is the one and most important thing you can do. You have to have status first. See? Okay. So if he doesn't have status first, he's pretty much going to have to pay that. Well, it's his own consent, his own detriment. Is he a servant? Servant's got to follow the rules. <laughs> um, I'm curious if there's a way that you can mess up this process or go through this and get into legal trouble somehow. I'm assuming you can if you obviously don't follow the steps to a T or if you don't really know what you're talking about, but is there... Education is important. Yeah. It's just like driving down the road. If you don't know to stop at a stop sign, you might get hit. Yeah. It's that so simple. Learn the rules of the road. Learn your shit. Don't get hit. Yeah, learn your shit. Don't get hit. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's no different than anything else. I mean, I could probably give you 300 examples of things you got to learn to do before you go do them. So this isn't any different. Does being a national mean that you give up your citizen, your, your being a U.S. citizen? Absolutely. That's the change of status. So how does that affect getting a gun? Because through an FFT transfer, you have to claim that you have not given up your citizenship. That's right. You do. So does that mean that you are no longer eligible? To I got lots of guns and I buy them all the time. So do you just not check it and you can still get it or what? Guess what? When I go apply for a gun and I fill out the form, mine sails right through within minutes and I walk out the store with a gun. Okay. My gun permit started in 1791. 1791, the Second Amendment is my concealed carry permit. I can also have any weapon our military has. There's no law under the Constitution that says you have to carry, a certain way. carry it a certain way or have a certain kind of firearm or not have a bump stock or have a magazine that holds 50 rounds. There's nothing that says you can't have an A-10 or an A-1 tank. Okay. During our break, somebody reminded me of something. So let's just pretend this is a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It's a document of some kind. So what I did, forget this stuff up here, is I divided it into thirds to show you which side of the paper and what color ink you sign on. So typically on a commercial contract in the jurisdiction of the water, a document is written in black ink and you sign in blue. You sign your signature holding the office of a person of your vessel. You're the signatory officer. Okay? And you sign on the left hand side of the page. In the jurisdiction of the air, a trust, you sign it as a living soul in the center of the page, and you sign in purple. In the jurisdiction of the land, you, you autograph, this is an autograph too, by the way. These two are autographs, that's a signature. You autograph on the 
right hand side of the page, as a man, mankind, man or a woman. That's owning property. Right? It has to deal with titles and your rights, land, equity, anything of equity, a security, an investment, real money, gold or silver, your car, your household goods, anything you own of equity, and you want to lay title to those, if you're signing as a man, now what if I'm doing a legal document that declares my sovereignty? I'm going to fill it out and I'm going to sign it just like this on with all three in every jurisdiction and I'm going to have a seal underneath. And I'm going to have it notarized by three types of notaries. Oh, I know. See, there's a problem right there, too. So you got a notary public in the land. You got a notary republic. Uh huh. And then you got a notary, which is a jurat. Notary is a jurat. Notary republic. Notary public. Mm-hmm. So Gosh, half the notaries don't know that. But I'm one of them and I don't know. So I can only do the one that's on that left side. No, you can do all three. I can. Yeah. Depends on how you sign your name, whether it be a signature, whether it be an autograph as a living soul, and whether it be an autograph as a woman. As a notary. As a notary. And she can notarize all three of them. She can. She can. The problem is the state stamp she buys from the state signifies she's probably only one. Signifies that she may only be one, but she can order different stamps. And you can order stamps and make up your own stamps for your name. Every one of us should have our own seals, raised seals. They're important. Now, one thing about our seals, we can make our own seals up. We can use our family crest. We can do all kinds of things as long as we are consistent. One thing we can do in the land is we can use a $1 stamp and endorse it, sign it over, put it under the postal unit, the post office. Have you seen lately, uh, like in the last day or two, uh, everybody's worried about the United States Postal Service going bankrupt? I'm hoping it does. Because then the United States Post Office could come back. Yes. See, so the United States Post Office is our de jure postal office. The United States Postal Service is under the United States. This one's under the United States of America. The United States. Two different corporations, two different entities. One's a corporation, one isn't. One's de jure, one's de facto. USPS is not the same as USPO. A lot, uh, on envelopes for a long time, I will write on the envelope, right under my stamp, to be delivered by the USPO. And I walk into the same office, deposit. But they have to do what I tell them to do. So the US Post Office delivers my mail, not the US Postal Service. It crimps the paper into the seal, so it's raised. See, that's the thing about a warrant. A war rant is a declaration of war upon you. If it doesn't have a race court seal, it ain't worth the paper it's written on. So when you challenge a cop and say, that's not a warrant. Yeah, well, where do you get this SMU? That's what I tell him. I joke with him. I just smile, shake his hand, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day because I'm about to give you a hard time. <laughs> right? And I'm going to be nice about it. But where do you get this SMU? It's just shit made up. I said, where's the wedding signature of the judge? Where's the raised court seal? Is it from an Article One or Article Three court? Is it backed up by a claim, an affidavit, or a testimony sworn under the penalty of perjury by somebody? If not, it's just SMU, get the hell off my property. You're trespassing. This is your final notice. Come back when you have something. Sorry about your luck. But be nice, smile, 
It's all in how you handle it. Okay. You can or you can order them. You can go down to you can go down to Office Depot and order it. See, she just stamped her raised notary seal. Feel that. That's what, a warrant's got to have one of those with the court's information on it. Feel it. Our government was created under trust. Read the Declaration of Independence. Read the preamble. It's a trust indenture. It was created under trust as a republic. They owe us a republic form of government. That's their trust indenture. We are the fiduciaries as a state national, as a we the people. That's the United States Post Office. The United States Postal Service doesn't include general delivery. When I write my address, typically, I write in care of rural route, right there. And then I write the street address, and then I write the city, and then I write the state spelled out. Oregon, not O-R. Does that need to be in all caps? No. Okay. Do not make it in all caps. You don't know Absolutely not. The entire not no. I put the zip code in brackets for the square four corner rule to take it out of the contract. Only the five. Put the five numbers in. And then a good thing to do is WDC, without DC. Takes it out of the federal district. See, if I'm in Oregon and I get a federal indictment, the feds come after me for some bold made up stuff, right? And they indict me in Oregon. I'm not charged in Oregon. I'm charged in the ninth district of Washington, DC. They're, they're, using, they're using a different venue, a map overlay, as I explained yesterday how maps work. They just make a whole bunch of clerical errors on a map overlay, and you either acquiesce or you say, no, collect the, correct the errors, and then I'll accept it. Anyway. How does the postmaster fit into the de facto and de jure? How does he fit in? Yeah. Both exist simultaneously. It's just like the United States of America exists at the same exact time as the United States. It's just like Utah exists at the same time as the state of Utah. One's a corporation located in Washington, D.C. One's right here, this geographical area. Are you a Utahn? Then you're a state national. You're on the land. You owe your allegiance to the state. If you're a U.S. citizen, where do you owe your allegiance to? See this hat right here? Under President Obama, this said United States. President Trump gave me this hat. It says United States of America. Okay. Yeah, he's restoring the republic. Now it's up to us. <laughs> it's, all he's doing is giving it back to us. Now we got to go do something with it. I hope there's enough people to do something with it. Voter versus elector. Uh, this, this one isn't on your steps yet. I keep it off your steps because, boy, does people screw up when it comes to this. So usually once they get these steps, this is, becomes class three or four right here, okay? Your notice of electoral status to the Secretary of State. Once you become a state national, you're not a voter anymore. See, what is the difference? A voter votes for their leaders. An elector elects their representatives. Okay? Are you a voter or an elector? That's because you quit being a state national. So you create an electoral college that goes and votes on your behalf. 
as a citizen because that's all the slaves can do. But once you're a state national and a we the people, we elect our representatives and I can, de and I can declare my electoral status <laughs> and then every vote I vote counts for four. When I, when I checked with the State Department, this has probably been four, maybe five years ago, I asked them how many state nationals there were in the United States and it, how I did it with, with a FOIA request. So they sent it back to me and they told me how many there was. And back then there was about 45,000 total. And then I thought to myself, dang, I should have asked this question too. So I sent in another FOIA request and I says, how many state nationals out of the 45,000 via this FOIA request, see attached, are bar members? And it was about 40,000. Oh. oh, yeah, they take advantage of this. They're not dummies. Well, that's why when I see some of them in these courts or some of these proceedings that are represented. That's so why it's so hard to hang Hillary Clinton and Bill and those guys. It's so hard. You have to have such good evidence to charge a state national with. They have to have either done one of two things physically harm someone themselves, and we all know they hire it done, or commit treason. This is what we're going to get her on, treason and sedition. Treason and sedition, we're going to get her on. Shouldn't even go into this. Up until last week, up until last week, we never had any physical evidence that she harmed someone else or Bill actually harmed someone else that can be proved. Even the people that, who, who know he, they, he raped her, for instance, they don't swear anything under the penalty of perjury. They usually get paid off and they go away. Okay? So they don't really come forward, so to speak. But what if we had her handprint in the blood of a victim. Oh. Just throwing that out there. Okay. Get through the steps, then email me, how do I become an elector? Okay, then I'll help you. But if you don't get through the steps, there's no sense of me even telling you how to become an elector. I'm just telling you it's out there, okay? I can walk in with my electoral document that's, that's authenticated by the Secretary of State of the State of Oregon and walk into a voting booth and vote. And my vote counts for four people. You record everything. Everything becomes a court of record. Yes, I know. Okay. Your documents become a court of record when? No. Properly served, publicly published, and filed. Okay. All right. Registered mail is through the United States Post Office. Same as a court. I don't need to hire a process. No. Only if you go through the United States Postal Service. How do you know See, here's, you guys, it's all about jurisdiction. It's, here, here's the deal. What is a court? I said this yesterday. What is a court? Bank. It's a bank. If you look up the word court in a Black's Law 4th edition legal dictionary, it says C bank. C, post office. You look up the word judge, it says C, banker. C, postmaster. All courts in the United States were set up as United States District Postal Courts. If you go back east, where the buildings are older than on the west, you'll see courthouses that say post offices, courthouse, post office, courthouse, right on the building in stone that was carved 300 years ago, okay? That's how they were set up. Benjamin Franklin set it up that way, okay, as our first postmaster general. So if we use the United States Post Office, which is registered mail, nowadays you walk in and you ask for registered mail return receipt, they don't, uh, what, just send a certified. No, 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 that's not what I asked. 
See, I don't want to go through the U.S. Postal Service. I want to go through the United States Post Office. I want a registered mail return receipt. So that's okay. different. Okay. Registered. Now it's a court document. You understand? It's the same as a court. A court is a post office. A post office is a court. United States Post Office is a court. Now I've got a court document. It's served by the court. So <laughs> Well, it depends on how they were served. Did you have a sheriff serve it? That's okay. No. Did you have a court officer serve it? That's okay. Did you have a notary public serve it? It was notarized. It was notarized. No. no. Notary service. No. See, notaries can serve documents. That's right. You can? Yes. Can. Did you have yourself and two other witnesses <laughs> with one of your other witnesses actually do the service and you all three swore to it under... Yes. Oath penalty of perjury. That's okay. Yes, yes. 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 That's okay. Hold on. Registered mail is served by the post office by hand delivery like it was with the Pony Express. Right. It never enters an airplane. It is trucked across under lock and key box. So it's always in secure position. Certified can go any which way they want because it's not part of the post office. It's part of the post office. Absolutely. So that. when you're looking at that from a legal perspective, the service of that is 10 times more powerful than certified mail. Though the courts want to always send everything certified, IRS certified. I said it, I sent something back before I met my wife, registered mail back to the IRS, and they went silent. Because right. they could not. They cannot answer a registered mail piece because it's hand delivered and certified service. Certified, it go, comes under administrative and they can do whatever they want. It's administrative. Registered mail return. Yes, so the uh, registered mail, uh, like you can walk, what I experienced is you can walk in a post office, get a big stack of those green cards, they're, they're meaning they're worthless. And we discovered as you go into a post office and you want to get the registered mail, the little pink red ones, they guard those under lock and key. Smarter post offices in bigger cities are like they, they will only give you that once you pay for that at the counter and they're really strict. If they pass those out, they get in huge, big trouble. However, we discovered you go to some little outlying post offices, they don't really know what's going on. And you say, hey, I want to get a big, I want to get like 30 of those things. And they just hand them to you. They don't know that, but they could get actually in a big trouble. But you get those, because then what we do is we embed the number, the register, because it's a bond. You embed that registered mail number at the top of all your documents. So it's like, then now your documents are all bonded. Then you, you can't do that at the post office. Unless you, actually, I did. I would bring my computer and a printer <laughs> to them, and I'd do it there. Then I found out, hey, let's get them ahead of time. Yeah, that's the 200 label that I was telling you about. Oh, what was that? The 200 label. Is what oh. they call it. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. So anyway, also you know it's different. I, I knew it was different because then when you hand them thing with the registered mail, they actually have a special bag that they put it in back in there. It's like uh, the old what he was talking about, like the old-fashioned postal bag. So the lesson of the story is if you can find a postal employee who's not aware of the protocol and they hand you a bunch of those, uh, you made out big time. <laughs> Chuck, we're done with that subject, registered versus certified. I think we pretty much beat the dog to death. Would this be the issue with mail-in voting? Is because, it, I mean, I know it's a broken chain, but if, if they were all registered, then they'd be locked right. and delivered. And they're going to not do it registered. They're going to do it by regular USPS, and they can do anything they want with their voting. Let me tell you something. Oregon's probably one of the worst states and the best examples of voter fraud in the world. We've been doing vote by mail for 25 years. Ever since we started, we've never had a Republican governor. It's been a Democratic governor since the day they started voting by mail. You travel anywhere in the vast majority of the state of Oregon and you won't see one Biden sign. You will see Trump signs everywhere. We hold a rally. I just spoke in front of the Women for Trump group, 150 plus women. For an hour before we started the speech, 
They stood on the sidewalks on a fairly busy highway, and I mean busy, um, right by the first stoplight coming into town. And then they lined the sidewalks on both sides, and they had their flags and their Women for Trump pink shirts on and, and uh, other various signs. And the cars coming by were honking and yelling and shouting for Trump. People were going home in their cars, in their pickup trucks, and fly, getting their flags and coming back and making multiple passes. About two, three cars out of every hundred would yell Biden and boo and, you know, all this crap out the window. Maybe two or three out of a hundred. That just shows you, you know, I said this the other day, President Trump does an, in a sparsely populated state of South Dakota at a park that only 7,500 people can attend, six per car, he had 150,000 people apply for tickets in two hours, the first two hours of the lottery to get in. Biden can't fill a hotel conference room. Him, he announces his vice presidential pick. They show up in Central Park in New York, most populated city in our country, and they don't have 150 people listening to him in the park. Are you kidding me? Okay. And the polls, CNN poll says Biden's ahead by seven points. Where the heck are they getting that number? SMU. Yeah, it's SMU. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going? I don't know why I'm holding this. Got a mic on. Okay. What I want to talk about is know thy enemy. I was trained in warfare. My whole family was trained in warfare. We have fought, my family has fought in every war this country has ever had. We were at Lexington and Concord. We were in the War of 1812 and every war bef before or since for generations. Revolutionary War II. Trained in warfare. And the number one thing when you're trained in warfare is know thy enemy. Know who you're fighting against. When I ask people uh, who have a court case going on, a lot of times it's a child protective services case or something like that, I ask them a question. I say, who owns the courthouse that you're going to court in? I, I ask them, do they, they know the Dun & Bradstreet number of the state they're in? Do they know the Dun & Bradstreet number of the United States? Or the county? Or that city? Or that agency? Have they researched Child Protective Services in their, that area to see if they're a private for-profit entity? You just believe their government? Very few Child Protective Services agencies in this country are government. They're private, for-profit businesses. They're like subcontractors, just like the military has subcontractors. Blackwater, they go to some of these countries before the military even gets there. And they're doing stuff the military can't even do under the UCMJ, okay? I think Eric Prince is a son of a bitch, by the way. I met him in person. But <laughs> he works for the DOD, so that's okay. So anyway, you know, some of these, uh, all of these agencies are private for-profit businesses. We talked about this yesterday a lot. So when I say know thy enemy, and you're doing a legal document, I start out with a list of everybody I'm dealing with. The United States, Dun & Bradstreet number, blah, 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 blah. State of Utah, Dun & Bradstreet number, blah, 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 blah. This is right at the top of my legal document. 
county of Salt Lake, Dun & Bradstreet number, blah, 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 blah. City of Riverton, blah, Dun & Bradstreet number, blah, blah, blah. District Court of blah, 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 Dun & Bradstreet number. Federal Judicial District, Dun & Bradstreet number, blah, 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 blah. What agency am I dealing with? Department of blah, 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 Dun & Bradstreet number. Now it says Department of Fiscal Services, U.S. Treasury, Internal Revenue Service, any and all private for-profit de facto federal municipal subsidiary corporations, all venues operating under the color law being involved or affecting this case known as or unknown. Right at the top of the legal document. I'm calling them out. All of them. All of them. Every dang one of them. If it was a city of police department, I'm putting the name of that agency. Uh, I'll look up their corporate charter with the Secretary of State to see who's the registered agent of that police department or that entity. I research them to death. I want to know which beach I'm fighting on and if I got to fight on multiple beaches. That's how you win a war. And believe me, aren't they the ones that bring the war rent? Right? It's a war. So I want to know who the players are. And then it's, when I'm suing them, color of law agencies so named versus David Lester Strait, all caps, TM, trademarked. And then I put underneath that, I qualify it. By invitation, David Lester Strait, upper and lower case. One of we the people, petitioner, attorney in fact, sue juris. A living soul created by God, self-governed individual and ambassador of Christ, having taken dominion over the juris of the land, the air, and the water, and law. Man, they're about crapping their pants about now. And I haven't even got to the meat of it. Okay, then I put a court case number over on the other side with a little line down, you know, just on one side. I don't go all the way across the page, ever. Notice of special divine appearance, status, standing, and dominion. I'm putting them on notice of that. This is the first document I'll file in any case for anybody. And then I qualify that underneath it. I says to be treated as a certified sworn affidavit in writing. In other words, I'm gonna make this an affidavit, I'm gonna make it a court of record, and there's not a darn thing they can do about it. It's gonna be a settled matter before they even read it. <laughs> okay? Notice two, the above de facto governmental services corporate agencies. Qualifies that pretty good, doesn't it? Now comes David Lester Strait, upper and lower case, competent and sujurous as principal, as fiduciary, as trustee, an adult man, a living soul, a son of God, an ambassador of Christ, one of we the people, a creator of government whose status is well defined in Genesis 1, 26 or 28, and 2, 7. Job 32, 21 and 22. I keep going on here. Deuteronomy 1.17, Proverbs 28.21, Matthew 22.16, Galatians 2.6, and in the Maccabees and Ecclesiasticus 4.22, 4.27.10.5.35.13. I'm defined in all those scripture. Okay? It is in any case a sin unto God to accept the person. Therefore, it is absolutely against my beliefs. That's the very first paragraph. Haven't even got into the meat of it yet. <laughs> okay. My status, now I get into the meat of it, my status is also further defined in the United States Code, Title 8, Section 1101, A21 and 23 as a state national. My estate and or trust is described in 26 U.S.C. 7701, A31 as a tax-exempt foreign estate and or trust. 
And as a non-resident alien individual in the Internal Revenue Code at 26 U.S.C. 7701 B1B, therefore there shall not be any presumption of my status as it is my gift from God and my unalienable right of self-determination. And I spell unalienable a little different than most. Every time I write the word unalienable, that's how I write it. Every time. They cannot place a lien on it. They're not able to place a lien on it. Okay. What kind of lien would they try to place on it? Just so I understand. They hold your body as surety for the bond. That's a lien. Okay. Being sued jurist of one's own right is derived from taking dominion over all three jurisdictions in being self-governed. That's what it means to be sujuris, to take dominion over all three jurisdictions, to be self-governed. We the people lay down the law, and when our public servants step outside of the law in which we the people lay down, then they are committing a violation of emolument. Article 1, Section 6, Clause 8. In order to make that determination, I mandate that at least these three questions shall be asked of the magistrate. These questions are, went over this yesterday. Are you claiming to derive your authority over me from your oath of office and any and all other requirements required by the state or federal government that you must have to hold your honorable position? And are those requirements complete and up to date? As discovery, May I have written confirmation that all the requirements have been met on or prior to this date with copies thereof? Okay. Are you claiming to derive your authority over me from the doctrine of parents patre, where the state is the parent? Are you claiming to derive your authority over me from the state of statutes by laws of the corporation? If your answers are yes, then your authority and claim of jurisdiction is hereby openly and publicly challenged. Right off the bat, challenge their jurisdiction. Now, as soon as you challenge their jurisdiction, they gotta hand it off to somebody else, don't they? Technically, they can't determine their own jurisdiction. So, now, as I am, claiming the minor estate and have taken dominion over the land, the air, and the water, law, as I am commanded by my God, as I possess a private express trust, giving me the tr trustee as fiduciary, the responsibility to act in the best and most honorable position on behalf of my heirs and beneficiaries, successors, and or assigns forever, thus taking dominion of the jurist of the heir, and thereby having an express trust overriding any implied trust. As I possess the superior titles to all properties held by that trust, its patents, deeds, grants, certificates, titles, securities, household goods, minerals, commodities, cash, and other properties, including the vessels, thus taking dominion of the jurists of the land, thereby overriding any all inferior or abstracts of titles implied. <clears throat> As I possess a successful business acumen to maintain a business license by the state, bonded by gold and silver, having the intent to make a profit with products offered for sale in international commerce, and possessing the copyrights and trademark names of the vessels under contract with the business, including its bank accounts and EIN numbers, thus taking dominion of the jurisdiction of the water. Under USC Title 15, the state may regulate commerce, but shall not interfere in it. And I put shall not in capital letters. Therefore, bring forth the superior trust titles and contracts or dismiss this case with extreme prejudice. I mandate the return of all private properties to me immediately. As discovery, please authorize risk management to provide me with all malpractice, malfeasance, insurance policies, and bonding information so I may make a proper tort claim. Herein, now known as petitioner, by and through his choice, may, if he chooses, use any non-bar lawyer, attorney, in fact, or next friend or private attorney general for lawful counsel, having full power to act in the same manner as the principal, giving notices, fiduciary, agent, attorney, in fact, 
acting by, on behalf of the principal as one of we the people, and as an officer under executive order of the president, provide legal services and enforce equal protection under the laws as loss prevention in the matter listed above court file numbers. See power of attorney in fact filed with the county records office. I take fiduciary responsibility as an informant with honor hereby filing this notice of special appearance as to my status as sue juris, fiduciary expert and friend of the court per the following circumstances an establishment of practice to retask my fiduciary obligations to voluntarily serve we the people of the United States of America as loss prevention co-counsel for the government of the United States of America and appellant in this matter. Reus Expedio Fit Actor. That's Latin. On March 13, 2017, the President of the United States issued a lawful executive order number 13781 in which the President Donald J. Trump, as President of the United States of America, asked for help from we the people to assist in the restructuring of the executive branch, citing the QTAM provision of 31 U.S. Code Section 3730 BNC. I am following said executive order in a continued effort to expose the continued assaults upon the court by frauds upon the court through malfeasance of office and prosecutorial misconducts resulting in emoluments violations. In order for this fiduciary to effectively make his report to the President of the United States per Executive Order 13781 and 13825, we must first define in context and apply the following three terms as outlined in the executive order as viewed by the court under the equal protections promise beyond their dictionary definitions as follows. An emolument, and then I use the Latin term, terminology for emoluments, meaning in order rightly to comprehend a thing, it is necessary first to inquire into the names for a right knowledge of things depends on their names. This is where we separate the men from the boys, <laughs> right here. Definition, any advantage, profit, or gain received as a result of one's employment or holding of office. <laughs> Libel, the law punishes falsehood. I use the Latin definition and it means the law punishes falsehood. The definition, published false statements that is damaging to a person's reputation or written defamation. Okay. A fiduciary duty, justice is to be denied to no one. I use the Latin term and then I, it means justice is to be denied for no one. Definition, a fiduciary duty is a legal duty to act solely in another party's interest. Parties owing this duty are called fiduciaries. The individuals to whom they owe a duty are called principals. Fiduciaries may not profit from their relationship with their principals unless they have the principals expressed informed consent. They also have a duty to avoid any conflicts of interest between themselves and their principals or between their principals and the fiduciaries and other clients. A fiduciary duty is the strictest duty of care recognized by the United States legal system. Capital felony treason is committed by any actor of a foreign state acting as a public servant pretending to be government who denies or deprives one of we the people any right given by God listed or written in any international treaty or any constitution of the United States of America or any one of its states. In Tim Holmes's case, Kirk Pendergrass and I stood in court on behalf of Tim Holmseth who sat right there and we called the judge out three times on the record for capital felony treason. Well, I walked up to the judge and I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, you're under arrest. And I said, I'll let you go if you dismiss this case with prejudice and you remove yourself from the court. And he did. And in Tim's follow-up cases, every time we removed the judge from the case. You can't do that unless you do this. Okay? Otherwise they'll arrest you and throw you in jail. So it's a dangerous thing to do and it takes a lot of guts. But Kirk stood there in a suit and he talks really good and he's smart and he knows everything and he knows the law and quote it up one side down the other. And I stand there in tactical gear at military attention 
and I make the arrest. It does. <laughs> okay. Deprivation of rights under color of law, USC Title 18, Section 242. See attached exhibits. I actually go to the Department of Justice's website, and I got William Barr to do this about a year and a half ago. Uh, we took certain titles that pertained a lot to we the people to protect us from government. And I asked the DOJ to make PDF files on their letterhead that give a summary at the top half of the page, a summary of what the title meant, and then state the title at the bottom. And so they did title 241, and they did 242, and they did a few others that we asked them to do. And it's really great, because you can go to their website, you can search for it, you can pull up on their letterhead. I recommend printing them off and handing them out like candy. Every time a police officer stops, you just roll the window down this far and you hand them one. Yeah, I mean, serious. We've got to train our people, our public servants or our people. Train them. So right on the Department of Justice letterhead, Title 18, Section 241 and 242. I also print out story of a mother and I attach it to this. I attach the deeds of reconveyances, the patents of nativity, the affidavits of repudiations, et cetera, to this document as exhibits. That's the first document I put into a courtroom, right? before you even go into court. And then I put my mission statement. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. To prove this, let these facts be submitted to a candid world. Where'd that come from? right out of the Declaration of Independence, right at the preamble of the Constitution. Certificate of Service. I hereby certify that a true and correct copy of the foregoing notice was served on the below persons, agents, and agencies under notice to agent is notice to principal, notice to principal is notice to agent. Example here, Department of Human Services, Northern Region 1, Clearfield, Utah, blah, blah, blah. And then I sign it and have it notarized. And I attach those other documents I go make them a quarter record at the county court or the county recorder's office, and then I go file them in the case. And you know what happens? They don't want to touch it. <laughs> I get a little letter in the mail, case dismissed. <laughs> and it's been happening over and over and over again. One document declaring your status, your standing calling them out for who they are, the enemy for who they are, and letting them know they're under the color of law, that we the people have the rights, not them, that we're not doing anything wrong, we're not at war, we're at peace, they're declaring war upon us, and solve the problem right from the get-go, that we took dominion, and they go away. All right. What, what happens if you hand that stack of papers to a police officer Oh, I just say, hey, officer, how you doing? Why don't you stop by my house sometime? Let's have a beer together or whatever. I'll pour you a Coke. Let's go over Title 18, Section 241 and 242, so you're better equipped to handle your job. So it's about education. It's all about education. Be nice to them. Love thy neighbor, do no harm. They're your neighbors. They might live right next door to you, right? Love them all. Love all over them. They're not used to that. It shocks the hell out of them. They, they walk up to the car window. I roll the car down and say, hi, officer, how you doing? I reach right across my nine millimeter and a shoulder holster with a, with a uh, silencer on it. It's got a Navy SEAL knife next to it. Because normally I wear them in the, su in the summertime. I don't like to, but I, I've always wear a SIG with a silencer and a Navy SEAL knife under this one and a thing on my belt. And, you know, I'm well prepared, well trained. Right? And I just reach right across, there it is. He doesn't want to leave the window now, right? But I just shake his hand and I'm real nice and tell him, ask him how he's doing, hope he's having a good day, he's being safe. I would really want him to go home to his family and I mean that. And I let him know that I mean it. And then he says, can I have your driver's license, proof of insurance, and registration? You were going 20 miles an hour with a speed limit. 
I said, I was being safe. You had to pull out of a parking lot just to, to find me on the road. I said, I'm the only car on the road, usually, right? I said, no, but here's my passport. It's the only document I use while I'm traveling. He calls his little partner up, hands him the passport. His partner goes back there, scans it. They have a little powwow on the back corner of my car. And he walks back up and he hands it to me and says, be on your way, have a nice day. One day this happened in Burns, Oregon, and I was on the phone with her. <laughs> and the officer got all done, said, be on your way. I says, I think I'm going to. There's a McDonald's in the parking lot. I'm a little thirsty. I'm going to go reward myself with a chocolate shake. <laughs> How long did it take? About a minute and a half? I'm done. I'm out of there. I'm on the road. I dropped a, a, a person off. About a year ago, I was doing the class in Logan. I had to drop somebody off at the Salt Lake City Airport. I was on my way back up 15 there, or whatever that road that connects to 15. I was on that road. Police officer stopped me. I was on the phone again. This guy took a little bit of time back at his car. It took me three minutes and seven seconds before I was back on the road doing 60. See? And it happens all the time. No, it is, it is all about being nice and having the right documentation. And then you have limited diplomatic immunity. This is another thing I also carry. I get the ones from the Cato Institute because they're exactly the same as a... Yeah, every time I go to D.C., I pick up some more. They're from the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's got the Declaration of Independence, it's got the Constitution, it's, it's got all the signatures of everybody, on and on and on. Okay. So do you think the cops understand why they let this go? Yes, they do. They do? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's been 10,000 court cases that say we have the right to travel. Yeah. It seems like they they just it. trip you. No, they understand it. They just trip you up because... You're a citizen, typically you hand them a driver's license, proof of insurance, registration, and then you say, but I have the right to travel. No, you don't, not by the time you did all that. Yeah. Now you're subject, <laughs> see? Yeah, I mean, it's a real simple thing to be free once you've changed your mindset. Once you've, I'm gonna call it repented for all the mistakes you've made in the past, and you do your documentation to reverse those. Now you're truly free again, like you were when you were born, between April 20th and May the 3rd. I was a state national. Okay. What was the red booklet? It's the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Oh, outside? Yeah. It's just, it's easy to carry because it's exactly made out of the same materials, same size, same shape as the Passport, so I carry them together. Okay. Can I, can I establish uh, the correct the status for my children? You can as your minor property, your minor children. So correct my status for explain my minor state. And you can do it all in one document. Now, here's the thing when they reach 18, they have the option to do whatever they want. In fact, you need to educate them because along the way, they may override what you did by checking boxes. I'm a U.S. citizen. Okay? In the federal government's rules, you're really a non-resident alien of Washington, D.C. That's what a state national is a non-resident alien of Washington, D.C. So when you go get your driver's license, you write non-resident alien. It'll say U.S. citizen or other. Mark other and put non-resident alien. If I'm driving my Uber, if I'm hauling pastors for hire, if I want to be a bus driver, if I want to be a public servant in the performance of my public duties, if I want to be a truck driver. Yeah, state and national can be anything they want to be, but you still, certain industries are regulated. 
the states can regulate commerce, they can't interfere in it. So they've regulated trucking, they've regulated transportation of passengers, they've regulated public servants. If you have one of those licenses and you're driving your private vehicle, you pull over, just hand the passport, you don't have them from the other one. Absolutely not. If I'm driving my Uber, I'm going to hand them a driver's license, proof of insurance, and registration. That's the jurisdiction I'm in. When I'm not, if I'm going to the grocery store, I'm going to hand them my passport. I'm traveling. I'm traveling in my private automobile. I'm not driving or operating a motor vehicle. See the difference in diction? Words are everything. Learn the English language. Diction is everything. Look every word up. If you don't know what the meaning of a word is, stop, put the brakes on, look the word up. Not in Webster's, not on Wiki, in a legal dictionary. Congress uses Bovier's. I like the older versions of Black's Law. Sometimes look it up in two or three. You'll get different meanings sometimes. Here's one thing the Bar Association is good at, changing the meaning of words. Don't let them get away with it. If they've changed the meaning of a word to something you don't like, define your word in your document, and then make it a court of record, and they have to go by your definition. I could call a pig a dog and define it, and I make it a court of record, they gotta call that pig a dog. It's that simple. Right? It's true, because that's what I believe it to be. And I made it a court of record. They have to go by what I say. I like fourth or fifth. The more the bar associated and corrupt stuff, the worse it gets. So, yeah, yeah. Pretty soon it's going to be a Sears robot catalog in an outhouse. Is there a reason to get a passport card? Or what's that all about? I was wondering why. Go get your passport. If you want the extra cards, buy them after you've done your passport the right way. Yeah. So, but do your passport exactly like I tell you to do it on that form, and you won't have any problem. Sometimes you got to fight with them a little bit, but that's part of having dominion, having strength, having the knowledge to stand and say, uh-uh, buddy, the United States Code defines status like this. They wouldn't define it if they didn't accept it. This is my choice of status. Issue me a passport that reflects that status. Thank you very much. Get it done. Have a nice day. We're all happy. Don't let them talk you into shit. Don't let them throw bear traps out to you and try and convince you and try and sway your opinion. Be firm in your foundation. Lay down the rules. Tell them how it is and demand that our public servants do what you tell them to do. I want to make sure this weekend that I help you all with any problems you may have or any problems you have coming up in the future. So if you have questions, I don't care if it's about the IRS, if it's about traffic, if it's about what, I can probably help you with them. I don't take taxes, help you with that. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Am I going to go to court for you? No. <laughs> I'll teach you how to solve it. Yeah. First of all, the states have gotten wonderful. In fact, Oregon, because it's been so democratic for 25 years that they've been mailing in ballots, Oregon Department of Revenue has been one of the worst. Here's what happens when you call the Oregon Department of Revenue. You get some little lady on the phone, usually, and you say, oh, I got this problem, and you lay this story out, and..." I need to get it rectified and I want to get it settled. How do I settle it? And she says, oh, have you, have you written them any letters? Have you done, done this, done that? I recommend doing that. And you hang up the phone. Maybe you write a letter or two and you call and you correspond. You, they can't even answer any stinking questions for you. They can't. They don't do it. They got like this telephone operating room. And they got all these people in it. 
you call back, you're going to get another person, and they can't transfer you the one that you've already told the story to. So you're telling the same story over and over and over again. This goes on for weeks, and they do it on purpose. They want you to get so frustrated, you just give up, pay your damn bill. And it just goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. Let me talk to a supervisor. Let me talk to a lien specialist if they put a lien on your property. And you finally get to one of those guys, and they go, oh, well, have you, have you sent in any paperwork? Well, I mean, has it gone anywhere? I mean, have you contacted one of the directors? I'm contacting you right now. You're the lien specialist. Oh, well, I can't do anything for you. I can't remove a lien. And they give you the runaround on and on and on and on and on. And that's probably what you found in any state, right? Okay. I'm going to give you a little key that it took me a while to learn. Finally, I ran into this little gal named Pam, and I think I intimidated her so badly that she caved. And she says, you have to ask for a level three auditor. If you don't ask, he's the only one that can make a decision on your tax case. That's it. Just him. And you have to ask for a hearing in front of a level three auditor. Took me a year and a half to learn that. Well, I'm trying to beat him back with a stick. A year and a half to learn that I had to go for a level three auditor. And guess what? When I finally found the laws, it's the same in every state. They're all set up the same way. You have to ask for a level three auditor. You have to ask for a hearing. Now, you prepare your story based upon placing the burden of proof on them. Was there a certified audit done? How did you arrive at the figure that you say I owe? Was there a certified audit done? Place your burden of proof back on them. Do it in such a way, and I'm going to talk about dynamic negotiation in a minute, but do it in such a way that you pin them into a corner and in such a way that they feel that if they took you to tax court, they might not win. The minute you do that, and in my case, $106,529.43 is what they said I owed. And in one hour and 56 minutes, I took them to the challenge in a hearing. And I got a little notice back 20, they have to call you within. So if your hearing appointment's at 10 a.m., they have to call you before 10 a.m. the next following business day. Now, if there's a, did it on a Friday, there's a weekend in there, it's Monday. They gotta call you before that 24 hour business day. If you had a hearing. If you, from your hearing day. They won't make a decision in the hearing. Usually it's a level three auditor sitting there looking like a judge and a level two auditor over here learning his job, and a level two auditor over here learning his job. They're learning what that guy does, so when they get promoted, they'll know what to do. So you get three people in there, and you're in this courtroom-like situation, nobody else in the room. You and these three guys, okay? So you just set up a hearing. I called for a hearing. I had a hearing the next day. I walk in there in an hour and 56 minutes. I laid it out for him. At 9.55 the next morning, five minutes before their 24 hours was up, he called me and said, you have a zero balance. Can you come in and pick up the paperwork? And I beat him. Because they couldn't prove their burden of proof. They knew they couldn't prove their burden of proof. Therefore, case dismissed. What else did you see besides certified audit completed? Huh? Well, you're asking if it was I spoke for an hour and 56 minutes. 
I know because I recorded it. That's a lot more than maybe you got certified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I'm telling you, this is just the key to even getting it heard. Otherwise, you're going to get the runaround for the next year until you give up and write them a check. The Internal Revenue Service is the easiest to beat in the history of the world. And every attorney will tell you, you know, don't fight them. They're so hard. It's pathetic. They're so hard. What did I tell you? The entire Title 26 of the United States Code is not law, first of all. Second of all, it's a gift tax. They can't tax a sweat of your brow unless you're a public servant. So he's got to pay taxes. Sorry about your luck. Yeah, but it's on your LLC. Yeah. I mean, it's your penalty for setting up an LLC. That's sole proprietorship. <laughs> Why would you register a sole proprietorship? <laughs> okay. If you're sole proprietor, you got all the blame, all the risk, all the everything. Right, right, right. You don't want to be a sole proprietor. No, I'm just wondering. Well, if, if you put all your assets in a, in a foundation or in a trust, and you're a sole proprietorship and you don't own nothing, no who cares? Yeah. Let them come after you. Can't get blood out of a turnip. Yeah. See? I was just curious if there was a, a way to around that. If, if one was a sole proprietor of, of business per se. I'm all about making your business something else, a PMA, a trading company, uh, uh, you know, the only reason to create a business in the water, an actual corporation, is to protect yourself through Title 15 in commerce, and that is only to protect your vessel. Okay, that's the only reason to do that, to have a business. There's no other reason to register a business with the state except to protect your vessel. No. If you want to run a business and make money, do it as a private membership association. The IRS is easy to beat. Okay, they have to follow procedure, and they never do. They never follow due process. They never do a certified audit. Because of Article 26 or 15? No, they just never do. I mean, I'm talking about against you, a U.S. citizen. They never do due process, ever. So you get them on due process charges. They, they never do a certified audit. Where'd they come up with a figure they say you owe? SMU? Out of thin air? They have to provide you with a certified audit. They almost never do. Oh, really Second of, that's right. Second of all, yeah, usually it's not worth their time on 600 bucks for, yeah. you know, it wouldn't be worth their time. They're just gonna write that off, yeah. okay? Second of all, they gotta follow due process law. They gotta follow banking law. They set up the rules, they're a collection agency for the bank. That's what they are. The IRS is nothing more than a collection agency. Do you know they have a debit and a credit department? Ogden, Utah, right here. You could send it to the I period R period. Here, let's talk about this. We talked about USPS versus USPO. Right? How about I period R period S period versus the internal revenue service? Know thy enemy, okay? I want you to believe me when I say this. So I helped a guy write an affidavit. He owed almost a million dollars to the IRS. They're coming after him hard. I helped him write an affidavit. I wrote this affidavit. He starts filling out the envelope, a manila envelope to mail the affidavit to him in. And he writes I period, R period, S period. And I go, wait, stop. Let's write Internal Revenue Service Attention Credit Department at the same address in Ogden, Utah. And then put the zip code in brackets. That's the only change I had to make. The documents already on the inside already said Internal Revenue Service. He mails them off. He gets a letter back from Bank of America. No shit. Bank of America bought the 
Internal Revenue Service. Credit Department. And you know what they did? They went off his birth certificate because we included it as an exhibit in the document and they gave him a credit of one million some odd dollars in some sense because we made him a creditor instead of a debtor and we sent him to the credit department. Now he had a credit on his taxes of a million dollars. How does that work? I'd like to know that myself. But it all has to do with the Sesta QV Trust. Fun, fun little things you learn along the way. Are you saying that guy already changed the status of everything? Mm-hmm. So is it balanced with you or is it? No, before I do anything, I change people's status. If I'm gonna help you do something, your status is getting changed. If you don't want to change it, truck off on down the road. <laughs> okay? I got a guy that went to prison for five years. He got out, he's on probation. Part of his deal with the federal court, shh, part of his deal with the federal court is that he had to pay back the IRS. I sent a very similar affidavit to the IRS for him, and the IRS sends a letter back, we're not gonna pursue you anymore. Your balance is zero. He had already served five years in prison for an IRS debt. Well, guess what? He's still on probation. The court got the document as well, and they closed his federal court case. It's closed, it's done, it's over with, the IRS isn't pursuing it, the IRS has zero balance. Probation is a private, for-profit business separate from the court, separate from the IRS, and the only thing they care about is they had an order from the court to follow through on his probation requirements. So the man's still on probation. They still ask him for a financial report every month so he can pay the IRS that he doesn't even owe. So he just turns in a financial report and he never has to write a check because they call and his balance is zero. But as every month they get, have to get a financial report. How much money did you make this month? What were your expenses? Because he's self-employed. And he keeps turning it in and they have to keep coming and checking on him where he sleeps at night. About once a month they check on him where he's at. He can't leave the state, he can't get a passport, he can't until his probation's done, up, which isn't for another 10 months from now. So probations are still running his freaking life as far as he, everybody's concerned, the court case is closed, the IRS, I solved those two issues, but I can't, do, I can't get through to probation. If I send a document about probation to the court, the court says, well, hey, the case is closed. We, we don't need it. They're all private for-profit corporations. They all have Dun & Bradstreet. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There's no de jure government right now except what's inside you and me. When we become a state national, we're self-governed, we're part of the United States of America. Same with the prison systems. All the prison systems are private. A lot of judges own the prisons. They got stock in the prison companies. Isn't it to their financial best interest to put you into prison that they have stock in? They get paid by the bed. I'm telling you, we, we the people have been letting all these people get away with murder for a long time. Literally. Yeah, Bill Gates has committed genocide in Africa. 400,000 children, 400,000 children in India is what I was about to say as well. Do these cases set precedents, right? When you're a state national and you do a case, when it's done and over with, quite often they wipe it off the face of the earth. They don't want some law student at Cornell or Harvard to pull up the case and say, Oh shoot, this is what we got to do to win every single case. They don't want that to happen. They'd go broke fast. Those banks would plunge into bankruptcy. The banks called courts would plunge into bankruptcy. So even like Gina's case here in Utah, we filed over 700 pages of documents. When she had already been tried, she had already been 
found guilty by a jury. I met her after her trial and before sentencing and taught her what she needed to do. I taught her that it requires three signatures to put herself into jail. And they were gonna sentence her for 15 years of her life. I told her she couldn't have an attorney. She had to be competent. She couldn't take a plea deal, okay? Those are the three things you have to do or have to know. And I taught her all this. And in doing so, in teaching the court, since we got to tell them all three times usually, we filed over 700 pages of documents with all the affidavits and things like that. When they dismissed her case and sent her home, even after she had been tried and found guilty by a jury, and sent her home, they handed her back 700 pages of her court documents and said, just take those, we don't want them. No, that's what they always do for us. See, like I said, they're in a business, a private for-profit business. They have a Dun & Bradstreet number. Seven county courts in the state of Utah are owned by one guy in Ogden, Utah. That's where his office headquarters are. He owns them just like he would McDonald's franchises. Are they government? No, they're de facto. They're acting as a governmental services corporation on behalf of the Department of Justice under the GSA program of the state. So general state accounts, but they call it something else, but it, that's what it started off as, the general state accounts. The federal government buys all the court cases from the states under the GSA program. And then Mary, from the federal court, handles it through the Department of Fiscal Services, gets all that money back. It's a business. Yeah. Okay. I read this document in every class because it's so important. So to give you a little history of this document, why I came up with it, is I was on a plane ride and I was surrounded by these guys in some really expensive suits. <laughs> and I was listening to what they were saying and they were talking about the law and I found out they were lawyers for the banks, the international bankers who were because we were all going, I, I went to sign on behalf of 14 sovereign nations as their ambassador to sign for the sovereignty accounts with the World Bank. It's kind of like the Convention of States program. If not enough states sign on, it doesn't matter anyway. But right now there's probably 16 or 17 signatures of countries to declare their sovereignty, to declare their own money, to declare their own money backed by gold and silver. And I signed on behalf of 14 of them. <clears throat> but I was sitting with this group of attorneys and they were all talking about banking law and all that crap. And I sat there and I bit my tongue for about three and a half hours. It was a nine hour plane ride. And then I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so I jumped into the, ed the education mode and I started educating them about the basics of law, land, air, and water, and the three jurisdictions, and how damn attorneys misuse the term jurisdiction on purpose to confuse the general public, and on and on and on. And I started educating them. After a few minutes, uh, maybe a half an hour, one of them piped up and says, well, who are you? Because I'm, I'm dressed like this on the plane, tactical boots, tactical pants just a regular shirt, and they said, who are you? And I said, oh, nobody, I'm just a farm boy from a mill town in Oregon. And they said, nah, come on, you know way too much. I said, my name's David Strait. 
And this one guy pipes up and he goes, oh, you're the guy the Bar Association's trying to shut down. And I said, me? Really? Why would they try and shut me down? I said, I don't think they can shut me up, much less shut me down. And another guy goes, well, they're going to get you with syllogism. That's what I said. I went, what? Silly what? Syllogism. But when he said that, all the others went, like, you weren't supposed to say that, right? Because it was easy. That's the way my neck turns. Anyway, that, that's what they, they did. They looked at him like, you weren't supposed to tell him that. See, that's a mistake they made. When they tell me something, I'm going to research it, look it up, and know the hell out of it, right? So I spent the rest of the flight learning about syllogism. <laughs> Always. Okay. So let's talk about syllogism. It's a noun, an instance of a form of reasoning in which a conclusion is drawn, whether it's valid or not. I found that part to be interesting. Whether it's valid or not. From two given or assumed propositions or premises each of which shares a term with a conclusion and shares a common or middle term not present in the conclusion. Now, does that make any sense whatsoever? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, for instance, all dogs are animals. All dogs have four legs. Therefore, all animals have four legs. The problem here is not all animals have four legs. So they use a couple of facts and twist the conclusion through syllogism. It's a deductive reasoning as distinct from induction. This school of epistemology is highly advanced in syllogism and logical reasoning. In other words, no fact or truth shall be tried in court. This is how they get you. The bar tries to destroy us using syllogism of the 12 presumptions of court. We can't accept presumption, assumption, <clears throat> tacit agreement, and hearsay. We can't be led down that path. So I made the 12 presumptions of court, along with syllogism, an exhibit <laughs> to file with our documents. But this is how it goes. All shall be considered rebutted. That's my headline. All shall be considered rebutted. In Canon Law 3228, a Roman court does not operate according to any true rule of law, but by presumptions of the law. Therefore, if presumptions presented by the private bar guild are not rebutted, they become fact and are therefore said to stand true or as truth in commerce. I told you, if a prosecutor gets up on stage and lies his ass off and you don't rebut or your attorney doesn't rebut, those lies become the truth and fact upon the record. I object. It's a lie, Your Honor. <laughs> Speak up. Hearsay. Hearsay. It's SMU, Your Honor. Don't think I haven't said that a million times. There are 12 key presumptions asserted by the private bar guild, which if unchallenged, make it a little bigger so I can read it better, which if unchallenged stand true, being public record, public service, public oath, immunity, summons, custody, court of guardians, court of trustees, government as executor beneficiary, executor de son tort, incompetence, and guilt. Those are the 12 presumptions of court. 
So I'm going to go through them one by one. <clears throat> the presumption of public record is that any matter brought before a lower Roman court is a matter for the public record when in fact it is presumed by the members of the private bar guild that the matter is a private bar guild business matter. Did you understand what I just said? Let me do it again because this is important. The presumption of public record is a presumption of public record. So you believe a court of record is that brick building down there. You have a presumption that that's a court of record. You think anything you say is on the record. I've already told you to make your documents a court of record so that they can't be just administratively thrown away or thrown out or deemed hearsay or we can't, you know. So now anything you say is now a court of record. Right. So <clears throat> the presumption of public record is that any matter brought before a lower court is a matter for the public record when in fact it is presumed by the members of the private bar guild, the bar association, that it is a private bar guild business matter. It's their business. You walked into their business under general appearance and it became a private bar member matter of business. And you thought you were getting justice and that you were putting your facts upon the record. When they're thinking no fact or truth shall be tried in court. Damn liars. They're liars and thieves. I keep telling you. Okay? Unless openly rebuked and rejected by stating clearly the matter is to be on the public record, the matter remains a private bar guild matter completely under private bar guild rules. So unless you rebuke the presumption and reject it and demand that it's on the public record or make your documents a court of record, then what they say becomes the public record. Then they think it's completely under private bar guild rules. That's why these courts have local rules. As a state national, do you think I have to obey their local rules? No, I tell them what to do. I don't got to go by their local rules. Okay? Number two, the presumption of public service is that all the members of the private bar guild who have sworn a solemn, secret, absolute oath to their guild. Their first oath is to the bar. Not the Constitution. Not to you. Who have sworn a solemn public oath remain bound by that oath and therefore bound to serve honestly in partiality and fairly as dictated by their oath unless openly challenged and demanded the presumption stands that the private bar guild members have functioned under their public oath in contradiction to their guild oath. Every bar member takes two oaths. One to the bar and one to the public. But they always stand under the oath to the bar first, unless you rebut and make them stand under the oath to the public. Unless openly rebuked and rejected, the claim stands that the private bar guild members are legitimate public servants and therefore trustees under the public oath. The presumption of public oath is that all members of the private bar guild acting in the capacity of public officials who have sworn a solemn public oath remain bound by that oath. If challenged, such individuals must recuse themselves as having a conflict of interest and cannot possibly stand under a public oath. So as you challenge them to which oath they are operating under. And once you do that, they have to admit it, that they're operating under the oath of the bar. This is why the judge, the prosecutor, and your attorney put you in jail. There are three signatures. Put you in jail, or you sign a plea and put yourself in jail. 
one of, the, one of the three things happen. I mean, those three things happen. Okay. The presumption of immunity is that members of the private bar guild in the capacity of public officials acting as judges, prosecutors, and magistrates who have sworn a solemn public oath in good faith are immune from personal claims of injury and liability unless openly challenged and their oath demanded the presumption stands that the members of the private bar guild as public trustees acting as judges prosecutors and magistrates are immune from any personal accountability for their actions so if you don't go in and challenge their oath then they're immune from you coming back later and prosecuting them that's why I challenge their oath. Judge, do you claim to derive your authority over me based upon your oath of office and any other requirement of the state to be a judge? Yes or no? See, there's a reason I do say that question. <clears throat> the presumption of summons is that by custom, a summons unrebutted stands and therefore one who attends court is presumed to accept a position and jurisdiction of the court. It's just by showing up under general appearance, you just show up, you're subject to the jurisdiction of the court. That's why we, if we're gonna appear, we gotta appear by special appearance. And it's best to appear by special divine appearance, see? Attendance to court is usually invitation by summons unless the summons is rejected and returned. You can reject the summons? Didn't I tell you you have a 72-hour right of refusal of anything? <laughs> unless the summons is rejected and returned with a copy of the rejection filed prior to choosing to visit or attend, well, well, what did that say though? Choosing to visit or attend? Whose choice is it? That's right. By choosing to visit or attend, jurisdiction and position as the accused and the existence of guilt stands. What did that just say? Unless the summons is rejected and returned with a copy of the rejection filed prior to choosing to visit or attend jurisdiction and position as the accused and the existence of guilt stands. <laughs> Just by showing up, you're presumed guilty. Just by showing up by general appearance, you've accepted jurisdiction and you're presumed guilty. CPR. Citizen, person, resident, they get your tacit agreement. They presume your status. They assume you've done something wrong. That's the assumption of guilt. They get your tacit agreement of you being a citizen, person, resident, and then they use hearsay to convict you. What is hearsay? A lie, right? These are actors acting in a position of government. And you believing that they're in a position of government, therefore you consent and you're presumed guilty right off the get-go. If someone is presumed guilty, who's the burden of proof on? They just placed it bound to you. They don't have to. They got your consent. <clears throat> yeah, and so they scare the heck out of you. They tell you to sign this plea deal right here and we'll only find you $1,200 instead of 2,000 and we'll only give you six months in jail instead of a year and a half and uh, you know, they'll make it sound really good. But if they give you any sentence, they can collect from your trust for the penal sum. As long as they can hold your body as surety for the bond, they can collect from your trust. I know, <laughs> she's just going, <laughs> I can't believe this. Yeah. That's right. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. They tell you that, right? How many law classes did they give you kindergarten through 12th grade? The presumption of custody is that by custom, a summons or warrant for arrest unrebutted stands and therefore one who attends court is presumed to be a thing 
and therefore liable to be detained in custody by the custodians. This includes the dead legal fiction non-human person that corporate government rules and regulations are written for. <laughs> Custodians may only lawfully hold custody of property and things, not flesh and blood souls possessing beings. Flesh and blood soul possessing a being. That's pretty good. I like that. Unless this presumption is openly challenged by rejection of the summons and or at the court, the presumption stands, you are a thing and property, and therefore lawfully able to be kept in custody by the custodians. You're just a vessel, a ship, a thing, a property. Look, you get a ticket in the mail, or by a cop, or a summons, or a letter from the IRS, or I don't care what. It's got your all caps name on there, right? David. You got 72 hours. So if you're smart, you would date, stamp, and time the receipt. Received, 814 at 4.03 p.m., right? Date, stamp, and time it. Now you got 72 hours to reject it. So I, I use a red Sharpie and I write right across the face, your offer to contract is not accepted If it's a ticket, I add things like while traveling in private in my private automobile. I clarify it, I qualify it, and then I say USC 18 sections 241 or 242. This is if one officer is involved this is if a, more than one person, it could be an officer, an attorney, a judge, is a conspiracy. Red Sharpies, dang right. So I carry red Sharpies in all my vehicles. I'll reject it right then and there and hand it back to the cop. Not sign it, just sign right that on there. Absolutely. Your offer to contract is not accepted while traveling in private in my private automobile. See, they operate under Title USC 18, 241, and 242 as a de deprivation to deprive me of my rights under the color of law. Can you make that symbol perception? Bigger so we can work down on it. It's like the handwriting lesson, section. Write it down in your notes. USC 18, 241, or 242. I'm just saying the little symbol section. Well, it's, a, it's an S stacked on top of each other. It's an S and an S. That's the U.S. government code. I, I can't even find it on a typewriter. So I spell out the word section just because I can't find it on a typewriter. <laughs> Got to have fun. Now, what is the cop going to say to you when you do that? I don't care what he says. If, if I don't want to hand it to him, if I think he's a low IQ idiot who I don't have time to educate, I'm just going to take the ticket and I'm going to mail it to the address that says on there, or appear at this court, you know, at this time. I'm going to mail it immediately. Sometimes I'll, well, Gina the other day called me. She says, I'm on my way home from work. I got a ticket. What do I do? I says, you're offered a contract. It's not accepted. Well, traveling in private, my private automobile, Title 18, Section 241, 242. Write it on the face in a red Sharpie. Take it to the court on your way home. She walked in. The gal read it. She walked over and she shoved it in the, in the paper shredder. Jeannie went home, fixed dinner, called me on the phone. Says, thanks a lot, Dave. It's that simple. I'm teaching you how to be free here. 
traveling in private in my private automobile. It's private. They don't have any control over your private business affairs. The United States Code was put there for one reason, one reason only, and that's for we the people to hold our public service accountable. They operate under the United States Code. When they do, a, the federal government does a lawsuit and they put the United States Code because you did this and you did that and here's the code and here's this, they're just claiming you're one of them, that you're a citizen, therefore an employee of government, so they're holding you accountable to their codes as one of them, see? Not as a man. But we get that all caps letter in the mail, we go, oh shoot, I got a letter from the court today. No, you didn't. Your vessel got a letter from the court. Not you. David, could somebody do this if they haven't claimed their status yet? Sure. Sure. It's more effective when you claimed your status. Okay? In case you're challenged. Where was I? Court of Seven, Court of Guardians, is that where I was? Oh, yeah, I love this one. Oh, gosh, listen closely. This one's fun. The presumption of court of guardians is the presumption that as you may be listed as a resident, you're a ward of a local government area, and have listed on your passport the letter P, you are a pauper, and therefore under the guardian powers of the government and its agents as a court of guardians, Unless this presumption is openly challenged to demonstrate you are both a general guardian and general executor of the matter of the trust before the court, the presumption stands that you are by default a pauper and a lunatic and therefore must obey the rules of the clerk of guardians or the clerk of magistrates court. They got the nerve to call you a lunatic. See, you're incompetent, you're infirmed, you're a minor, you're a ward of the state, a ward of the court, you're unable to speak for yourself. That's the only people an attorney can represent. I just listed them all off. They can't represent a man or a woman, somebody sued juris of one's own right. They can't represent you. So if you walk into court and the judge says, you gotta take this attorney, He's calling you a freaking lunatic and a ward of the court and a ward of the state and incompetent and unable to speak for yourself and a minor. He's saying, you're not a man. Don't stand up here. You haven't proven yourself. You haven't taken dominion over your jurisdictions and you haven't taken your status. You haven't claimed your status. And you sure as heck haven't claimed your minor account. So what are the three things we gotta do? Claim our status? claim dominion over our three jurisdictions, and claim our minor account. Now you're sued jurist, now you're of one's own rights, now they are your public servants, start ordering them around. Order them around. Be nice about it, but order them around. Treat them as your neighbor. Number eight is the presumption of court of trustees is that members of the private bar guild presume you accept the office of trustee as a public servant and government employee. Just by attending a court, as such courts are always for public trustees by the rules of the guild and the Roman system, unless this presumption is openly challenged to state you are merely visiting by special invitation only to clear up the matter and you are not a government employee or public trustee in this instance, the presumption stands and is assumed as one of the most significant reasons to claim jurisdiction, simply because you appeared. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say. There's two ways to appear in court, by general appearance. Just show up, they call out your name, you walk up. They say state your name and address for the record. Sometimes they say that, sometimes they don't care. And you say, my name is David Lester Strait. And he looks at his paper and it's got the all caps name and it says David Lester Strait. He just heard what you said, even though you meant the man, the lower up, upper and lower case name. He can't distinguish that from what he has on his paperwork. So he presumes your general appearance and then they fry you and court martial you and hang you or whatever they do to you. 
doesn't matter, fine you. Do whatever they want because you've accepted jurisdiction, you've given them your consent as a citizen, a person, and a resident. The legal definition of a resident is someone there temporarily to do business, putting you firmly in their jurisdiction. Okay. The presumption of government acting in two roles as executor and beneficiaries. Didn't I say the judge pretends to be the executor and the prosecutor pretends to be the beneficiary? Making you the trustee? Here it is, the ninth presumption of court. Is the presumption of government acting in two roles as executor and beneficiary and for that matter at hand, the private bar guild appoint the judge, the magistrate in the capacitor of executor while the prosecutor acts in the capacity of beneficiary of the trust for the current matter. Unless this presumption is openly challenged, in other words, you walk in with your express trust in hand, <laughs> to demonstrate you are both a guardian or general executor of the tr matter trust before the court or the trustee having fiduciary responsibility, the presumption shall stand and you are by default the trustee therefore must obey the rules of the executor, judge, magistrate. So the trustee obeys the rules of the executor. Now, see, in my trust, I make God the executor. I obey his rules. I'm the trustee. My heirs are the beneficiaries. Which removes anybody else from being able to be That's the right. executor. Because I've named them and I've walked in with my express trust in hand, then the judge can't be the executor. He can't, the prosecution can't be the beneficiary. Number 10 is the presumption of the executor de son tort. This is a very interesting law. The executor presumption of executor de son tort. That presumption is a presumption that if the accused does not seek to assert their rights as executor and beneficiary over their body, mind, and soul, they are acting as an executor de son tort or a false executor. <laughs> Challenging the rightful judge as executor. Therefore, the judge magistrate assumes the role of true executor and has the right to have you arrested, detained, fined, or forced into a psychiatric evaluation. Unless this presumption is openly challenged by not only asserting one's position and questioning if the judge or magistrate is seeking to act as executor de son tort. So we should ask the judge, are you acting as executor de son tort? Yes or no? Get an answer. But you just better never be in that position. The presumption stands and a judge or magistrate of the private bar guild may seek to assistance of bailiffs or sheriffs to assert their false claim upon you. Number 11, the presumption of incompetence is the presumption that you are at least ignorant of the law therefore incompetent to represent yourself or present yourself and argue properly. Therefore, the judge, magistrate, as executor has a right to have you arrested, detained, fined, or forced into a psychiatric evaluation. Unless this presumption is openly challenged to, yeah, how many law classes did I give you? <laughs> Unless this presumption is openly challenged, the fact that you know your position as executor and beneficiary and act actively rebuke and object to any contrary presumptions and it stands by the time of pleading that you are incompetent, then the judge or magistrate can do what they need to keep you obedient. Keep you obedient. What is a misdemeanor? That means your attitude is bad and you're at miss. A misdemeanor is having a bad attitude. You're not obedient. All right, number 12. <laughs> the presumption of guilt is a presumption that as it is presumed to be a private business meeting of the bar guild, you are guilty whether you plead guilty or not plead or plead not guilty. Therefore, unless you either have previously 
prepared an affidavit of truth and motion to dismiss with extreme prejudice onto the public record or call a demurrer, demir, then the presumption is you are guilty and the private bar guild can hold you until a bond is prepared to guarantee the amount the guild wants to profit from you. This is why I say this for Saturday afternoons. Because it ought to piss you off. So right out of canon law, canon law regulates the courts because it regulates trusts. That's why the judge is called your honor. That's why it's the first hat he has to wear. This is why it's the first jurisdiction that he has to adjudicate. This is why it's the highest form of law. The air is above the land, which is above the water. Because of this is the reason we all get screwed. And they do it through the doctrine of parents patriae where they have your jurisdiction right from the get-go. The state is your parent. So right out of canon law, they explain the 12 presumptions of court. And if those 12 presumptions aren't rebutted, they stand as a private bar guild matter and they can do whatever they want to you. See, in every ever area of the country I can travel, you could be a honky like me, a farm boy in a logging town from Oregon, speak one way or go down to the south and speak a little bit of French as a Cajuns, or up in the northeast and speak differently, and in Boston and speak differently, and all over the country speak differently, but the law does not speak differently. In the law, there are dictions, which are words. The words we use determines the jurisdiction or the right law under which we stand. Which is the right law? land, air, or water at that given time. You have to be very careful in your hearing in a courtroom. You, they'll, they'll go from one jurisdiction to the last one pretty fast. They'll go through the jurisdiction of the air almost immediately if you don't walk in with an express trust and hold it up and declare it and say, who the trustee is, who the executor is, who the beneficiary is. So law is land, air, and water. Three separate jurisdictions. Each has their own words. You have to be cognizant of the words that they use at that given time. If they're talking about an executor or a fiduciary or a trustee or a beneficiary, they're operating right now. He's got his honor hat on and he's operating in the jurisdiction of the air. If he's talking about parties and contracts and this and that, he's talking about the jurisdiction of the water. If he's talking about property and equity and rights and he's, he's in the jurisdiction of the land and you gotta be able to follow that while you're in court and match him with words that pertain to that jurisdiction. The minute you mix jurisdictions, he's got you. Now you can mix jurisdictions in how you present it because you can take your all caps name, this is what we're talking about, right? Okay, you can take your all caps name, your vessel, and you can accept the property ownership of the ship and place it upon the land. You could place the operation of the ship in a trust and you could trademark the vessel. You can combine all three jurisdictions by doing that and protecting that vessel in all three jurisdictions of the law. The more you're protected in all three jurisdictions and you have the burden of proof with you the express trust, the superior titles, your patents and trademarks and copyrights and so on, your contracts. Now there's nothing left for him to adjudicate. This is the key to winning. You just stop before it even starts. 
You're stopping it before it gets started, right? I mean, what happens if you reject the summons right off the bat? You get a summons in the mail. Hey, appear at court. You go, your offer to contract is not accepted, and it's date time staffed, and it's sent back within this period of time, and it's filed in the court case. You ran down, you recorded it with a county recorder, and you shoved it in the court case at the courthouse within 72 hours. What if you missed it? What if it was four days later? <laughs> Right, five days later, you miss a 72 hour window and they send you a little letter that says, hey, we're not kidding here, appear in court, here's a summons. If you don't appear, we're gonna send out a war rant, <laughs> pick you up, right? Do it again. Your offer to contract is not accepted, <laughs> right? Even if so, even if you missed it. Right, but you can do it another way too. So this is what I was gonna finish up today with is dynamic negotiations. What does the word dynamic mean in the law? It means to keep things moving. Keep it moving. Let's roll it along. Keep it moving. That's what dynamic means. Negotiation means to go back and forth. So they send you a document in the mail. Says this and this and this and this and this. Accusing you of something. And you want to open dynamic negotiations. So you got whoever sent you the letter, usually some attorney somewhere, acting as government, lying his ass off, assuming you did something wrong. And you over here, and your job is to go back and forth with him and keep things moving. As long as something is in, under negotiation, there's nothing to adjudicate. You don't have to go to court. You're going back and forth with them. That's how attorneys keep things rolling. That's how attorneys keep things rolling. They just go back and forth. The judge, judge walks in and he sits down and he goes, have we come to an agreement yet between you two? So the object of the game is come to an agreement, right? So he states this. You did something wrong. What your job is to do is to rake that document for statements. Get out a yellow pad, write down all his statements, write them down. Okay, he made that statement, and he made that statement, and he made this statement. And then you write him a letter back and you go, all right, Mr. Attorney, you said this. I accept that statement if, qualifier, big if in here always, if, you can prove to me that you have the authority to make that claim through your oath of office. I accept this if you can prove that I'm subject to the statutes as an employee of government. See how I'm pinning them in a corner? Yeah. I'll accept this statement if you can prove that I am subject to the doctrine of parents patriae. I'll accept this statement if you can prove I owe that tax amount. Where's the certified audit? I accept this statement if, and then pretty soon he sends you a letter back, and he says, well, forget this statement. I can't prove that one. <laughs> and forget this one. I can't prove this one. But forget this one. I can't prove this one. But let's talk about this one and this one. And maybe he adds two or three more. Okay. So you rake the second document for statements. And you say, okay, Mr. Attorney, I accept this if you can prove that I'm not a state national and have limited diplomatic immunity. I don't care what you throw in there. Your job is to pin them into a situation that they cannot get out of. And you eliminate 
everything that they said. Because all they're doing is what? Presuming your status, assuming you did something wrong, you get trying to get your tacit agreement that you'll show up by general appearance. See? And then they're using hearsay or shit made, this whole thing is shit made up. Okay? To try and convict you. So you just ex break their documents for sa statements, accept them if they can prove this. And you just start dynamic communications and pinning them into a corner. Three or four letters down, it's over with. It never even goes to court. I have a document on here that's called Marriage, the Contract that Binds You. Really good document to read. Okay, here it is. All right. I promised you guys I would go over the parts to a lawful contract. Eight parts to a lawful contract, right? What are they? An attorney will tell you there's only three. They do that on purpose. Okay? There's one of these parts they don't even want to tell you about because they'd lose a ton of money. First, parties competent to contract. The very first element of a contract is having parties competent to contract. The parties to contract should be competent being of the age of consent, of sound mind, not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he or she is subject. A flaw in capacity may be due to minority, lunacy, idiocracy, drunkenness, or dissimilarity of any kind. The parties should be of the same kind, being either legal fiction actors or natural living men and women, allowing more than two parties, but never a mixture of these kinds in their respective jurisdictions. Wow. <laughs> Number two, free and genuine consent. There must be free and genuine consent. The consent of the parties to the agreement must be free and genuine. The consent of the parties should not be obtained by misrepresentation, fraud, undue influence, coercion, or mistake. If the consent is obtained by any of these means, then the contract is not valid or legally enforceable. Number three is full disclosure. When negotiating a contract, full disclosure is the step of providing all material information or telling the whole truth about any matter which may influence a decision maker of the other party or parties before they decide to enter into a contract. If either party fails to make full disclosure, the contract is null and void. Number four, valuable consideration. The consideration is something of value possessed by the parties that is brought to the contract table. This something of value is bargained for and given in exchange for a promise or a performance. The parties must each receive a benefit and each suffer a detriment. And what do you mean each suffer a detriment? It's a compromise. If I gotta come up with money, that's a detriment but I get a benefit, so yeah. yeah. To be enforceable, a contract must have valuable consideration. A contract is enforceable if it has insufficient or unequal consideration without agreement. Certainty of terms. The terms and conditions of the contract must be fully disclosed and agreed upon and must be certain and fixed. Any subsequent variation of the terms must be agreed upon. In other words, they can't change it like yours did. That's number five? That was number uh, five. Number six, meeting of the minds. A meeting of the minds, a consensus ad litem, occurs between the parties when they recognize each other, understand their mutual obligations, and agree. A meeting of the minds occurs between living men and women in lawful matters under common law jurisdiction, and between legal fiction actors in legal matters, admiralty maritime jurisdiction. A contract must be either lawful or legal. 
if one party to a contract makes a signature as an accommodation party to a legal fiction person, while the other party makes an autograph for a living man or woman, the parties are, are of unequal kinds and the contract is null and void. Autographs or signatures is number seven. Lawful written contracts between living men and women must carry the wet ink autographs of the parties comprising living identification such as a thumbprint. But more often, living standing is recognized by an unambiguous declaration with a handwritten wet ink autograph, including the prefix by and or the words all rights reserved or without prejudice written below. Legal written contracts between legal fiction actors must carry the wedding signatures of the parties as an accommodation from a man or a woman. In other words, the man or the woman is the signatory for the vessel. Number eight, one of my favorites. Privity of contract. A contract exists only between the parties. No third party can obtain rights contained within a contract or buy or sell a contract without the express permission of the original parties. So you go to the doctor and you run up a medical bill and all of a sudden a collection agency calls you. He went into the hospital, he bought the medical bill for 40 cents on the dollar. And he calls you up and says, you owe ABC Collection Company. And I go, did you pay off my debt at the hospital? Thank you very much. I really needed it this time. It's been a real hardship being sick and being in the hospital. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. But between you and I, there is no privity of contract. And it's over with. Yeah, I really do. Send him a thank you card. Appreciate it. Really, really needed that at this time. That's the eight elements of a contract. So you, you just email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I spent about 35 years of my life learning the law, about 50 years learning history. I read a lot, I read fast, and I read every day. And the reason I put on these seminars is to consolidate time frames, to teach you as much as I can, as quick as I can, so that you can take the information and go be free, and then you can go fishing. Because if you spend the hours that I put in, you're going to waste your whole freaking life. I could have been fishing. I'm appreciative that you did. What's that? It's a clock. Okay.